What is this thing right here? Oh, I love it. I'm like, okay. I like gadgets. I'm thinking, what is this? Praise God. Amen. How we doing this morning? Good. Amen. 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 Can we give God praise for our brother Smitty Drum? Amen. This morning. Come on. Amen. I don't know where he's at, but praise God for him. Amen. For standing in the gap. Amen. Last week and delivering what I believe was a, was an on time word. And that was first, I think that was the first for Smitty. Amen. But you know, the confidence uh, that I had in him and most importantly that God had in him to uh, do exactly what we know uh, God wanted him to do and to say is a beautiful thing. The church address hasn't changed. The word got preached and we're still called Emmanuel. Amen. So <laughs> praise the Lord. Amen. I am so grateful for him and his family, uh, for the worship team uh, to again to just continue to do what, what they do. Uh, we uh, had the opportunity last weekend to uh, join another couple together, another husband and wife. Amen. I, and I think that's worth giving God uh, praise for. Amen. Zach and uh, Kelsey, uh, D uh, Maria and Don, it was beautiful. Uh, Courtney and Aaron were actually married the same weekend, and I couldn't be uh, there for both. So, amen. Praise God for them. And uh, I couldn't be there, but I, I made sure uh, that I FaceTimed them and I had FaceTime Aaron uh, the morning of his wedding. You know, guys, the grooms, they really, they just kind of hands in their pocket, chilling, waiting to go through the motion. Uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't get a hold of, of court. You know, probably she paparazzi and makeup and all in her, people all in her face and eyebrows getting done and lashes and dress and veil and all this cool stuff. So, uh, but yeah, it was a good time. And uh, same thing with Kelsey. I think I, I told you, I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to look weird or like peeping Thomas, but the window right where the DJ was, I, I kind of peeped and got on my toes a little bit and I looked in the window and I saw uh, Kelsey getting all done up and, and beautiful. And uh, it's funny stories, I gotta I got tell this. I, I'm driving up uh, to Bermuda Run and where the, where the venue was and I kind of, I do this thing in my mind where I, I, I kind of run through what I'm supposed to do. It's kind of an army thing, we call it. Uh, PCI, PCC is like pre-combat inspection and checklist. So I'm going through in my mind, making sure I got everything. I'm like, yeah, I got my shoes, um, got my, my undergarments, got my personal hygiene. We got gas in the tank. I got my message. You know, kind of what I, what I feel like I'm, you know, the Holy Spirit wants me to speak on. You know, going through all of that and I'm saying, okay, well, I'm, I'm almost there. I'm about 15 minutes from the venue. We got uh, the rehearsal dinner coming up. Oh, what am I going to be wearing? Oh, what am I going to be wearing? I look around in the truck and right on that little hook dangly thing where my dry cleaning is supposed to be, my dry cleaning wasn't there. And I'm about 15 minutes from the venue. So I'm like, Holy Spirit, I need you. So I start making phone calls and I got a hold of one brother, praise God for him. He's my superman. And I said, brother, please tell me in Jesus' name that you are still in Denver, North Carolina. He says, yes, I'm in Denver. I said, brother, listen, I, I, I need you. Go to the cleaners. I'm going to call the cleaners and let them know who you are. I need you to pick up my dry cleaner, man. This would be a very awkward wedding if I officiated in what I'm wearing right now. Please go to the dry cleaning. I will pay you double for your trouble. Give me your Venmo, your cash app. I will bless you in Jesus' name. So it showed up. It's good. Wedding day, part two. About an hour before, you know, I'm going through some motions. I end up calling Don. I wanted to talk with him a little bit to kind of go over some things and see where his heart was. And in comparison to where my mind and where my heart was, we start talking a little bit. I FaceTime Missy about an hour, hour and a half out. She was still out of town. I wanted to see the grandbaby, hear her voice a little bit. And I'm going through my motions. I got some worship music in the background, kind of rehearsing the notes over in my mind. And I said, all right, I got my dry cleaning, everything's good to go. Got my socks laid out. 
got my dress shoes laid out. I got this little routine that I do to kind of buff them up a little bit, make sure there's no mud in the creases, getting the dust off, get a little luster to them. I'm doing that. I get my shirt. I said, oh, oh, let me go grab my tie. I looked at my tie. I said, oh, man, my tie is popping. I made sure it was straight because I'm real particular. I like how I like my tie. And I had this new shirt that I bought from uh, Joseph A. Banks. So I was ready, had the collar, everything was open. I'm like, yeah, I'm ready for it. I'm doing my thing. And I get my shirt and I start the button. I said, well, let me brush my teeth again, do the mouthwash thing, because I don't want any stains on my white shirt. And I'm, I'm going through all of those emotions. So I put my shirt on, my undergarment. I start doing that. I get my tie and I go in to put my pants on last before I get in my shoes. And I go and put my pants on and, and they're black. I hold them up. They, they got the crease and everything looks good. And I still got my music going on in the background. I take my right leg and I start to put it uh, through the pants leg. And I notice something that it's a little tight on my calf. And, you know, I, I've been out there army almost a year and a half. And, you know, I've, I've gained some weight. You know, I've kind of <laughs> let myself slip a little bit. So I'm thinking, yeah, maybe I put on a little bit more pounds than, than I thought. And, and, and I start to stretch the pant and pull it up just a little bit higher. And what I started to notice real quickly is that it wasn't going anywhere north of my kneecap. <laughs> and, 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 and now I'm like, okay, what's going on? Because I'm starting to look weird. And, and I go and stand in front of the mirror and it's really weird. And I said, man, let me pull these pants off real quick and see what's up. And then I hold the pants up and look at the tag and they say Express 10S. And I'm like, Express 10S, what is this? This is these are Missy's pants. <laughs> Even baby girl laughing at me. These are my wife's pants. And I can't drive 20 minutes into Greensboro to stand in the mall to get pants to come back and probably miss the wedding because I am, after all, officiating it. So what in the world? And thankfully, in my gym bag, I had some black pants that I, were able to, I was able to kind of finagle a little bit and crease them up. And then I went and asked around, did anybody notice my pants on wedding day? And nobody noticed it. I was like, thank you, Jesus. This is so awesome. I had an adventure for this wedding day, but it was beautiful. I wasn't in bad company because the groom forgot his shoes. Don had the wrong pants on. I'm dropping dimes this morning. So I'm, I'll let you know I'm in good company, right? Everybody was just, you know, so I, I felt real good. But at the end of the day, again, we were able under heaven to put a beautiful man and woman and even court and Aaron. Praise God for what God has done through these marriages. Amen. Uh, maybe it was the Lord saying, you, you just need to take a time out from weddings or either, you know, it just shows the struggle. I don't think that would have happened if Missy was in town. She going north and south, so. Amen. She usually, she, she, she checks my six. Amen. All right, I'm telling too many stories. Let's go to work. Let's get into the word this morning. Second Corinthians, amen, chapter 10. Second Corinthians Amen. Chapter 10. And I, I can't really be long this morning. Honestly, I can't. Uh, we've got the opportunity and I, I may or may not get in, into the details of this uh, at the conclusion of service. But we've got a ribbon cutting ceremony that it's really uh, beautiful. It's an opportunity uh, not only for us to partner with, with a specific uh, partnership within the community, but it's going to be a blessing uh, for Emmanuel Church and for us to be a part of it. Oh, man, I'm excited. And I think it's either at one or two o'clock. So I, I really, really got to hurry up. But 2 Corinthians chapter 10, listen, if you uh, have been coming uh, just within the last few Sundays, uh, you know that we've been uh, taking a slow ride uh, through the book of Jonah. And in the book of Jonah, you, some of you may or may not have realized, but uh, the Lord God, he is, he is perfect, he's righteous, he's divine, uh, he's majestic, he's holy in all that he does, all that he says, all that who he is. For I'm talking about Yahweh, God himself. And, and one thing, again, that I want to bring to the attention of everyone uh, sitting in the church this morning and even listening online is that we serve a God that is not always going to give us what we want. Say amen. amen. I know that's not what you want to hear, but God all, does not always give us what we want. And on the flip side of this, God himself does not always tell us what we want to hear. 
In fact, when we go into the word, I think it's Philippians uh, chapter four, verse 19, the writer Paul says that the Lord God will supply all of our wants. Nobody corrected me? Somebody read their Bible, okay. God will supply all of our desires. God will supply us with everything we write down in our journals. No, God will supply all of our needs, which oftentimes what we discover is the things that we want often don't look like what we need and along the journey we are babysitting potential wants that never become the things that we actually need and the writer then goes on to say that these needs are according to God's riches and glories. Thank God for that type of God. And, and when you, I don't know if you remember this, but in, but in school, uh, when they would tell you, the teacher would tell you uh, uh, kind of how to construct the letter, there was the greeting and the introduction and then the salutation. And the salutation was right at the beginning of the letter. And the salutation was like the welcoming or the opening statement to let uh, the, the reader know who, who they were and, and all of this good stuff. And, and then you had uh, the body and then there was the body was all the important stuff. And then at the end of the letter was the conclusion. But, but one thing that I've discovered in the New Testament, especially when we start looking at the letters of brothers like Paul, Peter, and even James, is that right in the salutation, uh, they're not talking about natural blessings like a lot of us and even the churches in America like to exalt and, and kind of platform, so to speak. But, but the things that I hear these brothers talking about um, that they want to be multiplied unto us are two things, grace and peace. Peace and grace. And, and, and can I be honest? One thing, uh, Pete, that I'm starting to, to realize as, as my life uh, starts to wind down and I, I'm getting closer to someone putting the dirt over me and preaching my funeral is that, is that I, I believe that as, as it's written in the letters in the beginning that really what the Holy Spirit wants us to come to grips to and to really come to terms with is that how it's written in the letter in the beginning is like the way that Christ wants us to experience grace and peace on the front end of our life and not on the tail end of our lives. That peace is important. That, 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 that the what's going on right now, I don't know if you've been looking at the news lately, but it's, it's nauseating, it's, it's, it's sinfully disgusting in a way, it's, it's grotesque, it's extremely nasty, it's dark, it's wicked, it's perverse, it's satanic, it's demonic on every side, and, 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 and we need peace. Isaiah 26 and three says that if, that if we keep our minds stayed on God that he will be the God to do what? Keep our minds in perfect peace. Philippians 4, 7 declares that, 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 that God has a peace that surpasses all human comprehension. It's, it goes beyond human understanding that that type of peace that, that we can't really uh, uh, wrap our arms or our minds around will guard our minds and our hearts through Christ Jesus. Galatians 5.22 declares for the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, and peace. <laughs> huh? Are you hearing me this morning? Hebrews 12.11 declares that no chastening or discipline for the moment seems pleasant, but rather painful, but later it yields the peaceable fruits of righteousness for those who have been trained by it. I need peace and I need my mind to be regulated by the peace of God. And even banking and financial institutions today have programs within them that are called the peace of mind program that will guarantee the buyer or the subscriber a peace of mind. 
that everybody at the end of the day when the smoke clears and the rubber meets the road wants to have peace in their mind. But let me say this before we get into the word and I really have to hurry up, but, but the only one that can truly guarantee us peace of mind is the Prince of. Come on and say amen. amen. I need peace in my mind. I've seen people close to me lose their mind, not lose their brain, but lose their minds because the brain and the mind both biblically, naturally, and spiritually are, to are two totally different things. And if you've ever had someone on bedside who's lost their mind, it is a very, very, I mean, it just hurts. It hurts to see one person being intellectually competent in one minute and then in the next, they, they're not even able to identify mentally who you are. The power of the mind and the mind, the, the, the word in, in Greek is nous, the, 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 the soul, the psyche. And you, you may be wondering this morning, why is it so important to, to be able to guard and defend and protect my mind? Because you've got to understand if, if, if my mind is, imagine me just being the soul, being the mind this morning, I've got my spirit man or my spirit one man they're standing on the other side being fed something from the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is feeding my spirit, which is whispering and talking to my mind. That's on one end. I feel like preaching this morning. And when, when I've got the Holy Spirit that's ministering and talking to my spirit, that's speaking into my mind, then that means that the Holy Spirit has the opportunity and the ability to influence my spirit, which can ultimately influence my mind. But on the other side, I've got my body, my flesh, my sodics in the original language, that thing that is decrepit and wicked that stands on the other side and it's being fed things from the world, from the culture, Culture from the earth and it's also competing with the Holy Spirit that's standing on the other side because the Holy Spirit is speaking to my spirit that's speaking to my mind but my but the world and the culture is speaking to my body and both of them are trying to influence my soul and why is this important because the Bible says that the mind or the soul is the instrument that I use to serve the Lord. So if my soul, if my, if my psyche, if my mind is the thing that I use to serve the Lord, I can't afford, Brother Cliff, for the, for the mind to be contaminated, to be, to be polluted, to be, to, be, to be tampered with. I, I can't afford for anything to go, to go the opposite way because I need my mind to be kept at peace. My mind's important. And one thing I've always prayed to the Lord secretly that's no longer a secret now because I'll tell everybody is I ask the Lord, please don't, if you take any, take anything you want from me, Lord, but don't take my mind. I can lose every possession. I'm, I, I'm, I, I'm, I don't need the house on the lake. I don't need the newest automobile. I don't need a bunch of zeros in my bank account. But God, if you do anything, let me keep my mind. And if we can be honest this morning, I just want to, before we get into the word, and I haven't forgot 2 Corinthians chapter 10, but if I could just paint the picture for a lot of us, if we could be uh, just a little bit uh, uh, honest and just transparent, uh, a lot of us, and I'm talking to the saints this morning, I'm talking to the people of God, those who've been, who've been blood washed and born again uh, by the blood of Jesus Christ, the, the children of the day, uh, the children of the light, the ecclesia, the governing body. I'm talking to you this morning because if, if we can keep it real just for a second, let me paint the picture of what a lot of our minds look like this morning because, because this is a, a lot of our minds and our minds, they out of breath because they run and they've been running for a long time. We go to bed and our minds have been running. They running in fear and they're tired and they, and they about to give out. My mind's just been running. Fear, 
I see what's going on in the news, traumas, how I was treated as a child, I was abused, my mind's running, it's pacing. When I get in the shower, my mind's out of breath. When I go to bed at night, whew, my mind's running. When I get up in the morning, my mind's still running. You ever seen those runners? That after they get done running a marathon, because their body's so full of heat and exhaustion, that they take the water and pour it over their bodies because their bodies are so exhausted to the point that they want to pass out and they're out of breath and their minds running when they get up and when they go to sleep, when they in the shower, even when they do number two, the minds are still running when they think they've hidden and gotten away from everybody. Their minds are still running and their minds are tired and their minds need peace. They can only come from Christ. And the problem is, is that we, we, we've given over this mind to, to everyone but the one who created it. It'd almost be like a, a, a Lamborghini. Lord bless me for sure, Will. It'd almost be like a, a Lamborghini going in for service and no, against to my, no offense to my, for my guys who, who drive Ford, but there are better vehicles out there, Chevrolet. And, um, <laughs> Uh, uh, but, but a Lamborghini guy calling a Ford uh, service department and saying, oh, I've got question about the Lamborghini and I can see the Ford guy on the other end saying, <laughs> let me put you on hold. And then getting everybody in the service department to gather around and tell them don't laugh as they put them on speaker and let them know there's a guy from Lamborghini on the other end trying to get, get information on how to fix their car. And as funny and as silly as that sounds in the natural, that's kind of what it looks like in the realm of the spirit when we take our issues, our brokenness, our, our minds that are constantly running, the peace that we don't have, the dysfunction in our hearts and our minds and our relationships and our finances and our marriage and, and going to somebody and going to the world and picking up books and taking counsel from everybody but the one who created us. Why do we continue to yield our mind to the culture, to social media, to everybody else except for the one who made manufactured us down to the hairs that are numbered on our head. We have got to stop going to everybody else but the Prince of Peace who is God who created you and I. My mind. And what I want some of you to do this morning with me, partner with me in Jesus' name, is openly declare war against your mind. Tighten up your bootlaces, pick up your weapon, grab your brain bucket, I believe God is saying, get all of the armor that you've been called to equip yourselves with, Ephesians chapter 6, and pick up your weapon and let's go to war. There is no reason that the saints of the Most High God should ever lose their mind in a battle with Satan. The problem is that many of us have not openly declared war against Satan himself on my mind. And I don't know about you, but I'm ready to go to war because I cannot, I can't afford to lose the very thing that God has given me and put inside of me to serve him until the day that I die. My mind. Let's look at the writing of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul says that, that I myself am, I'm pleading with you. I'm, I'm, I'm making, I'm, I'm begging, I'm making an emotional appeal. And if you know anything about Brother Paul, he, he don't beg too much. But you know what I found out that I think is kind of interesting? Is that the only other biblical description that we have where Paul begs is in Romans chapter 2. And the thing that he's begging for here in 2 Corinthians is the same thing that he was begging for in Romans 12. You know what I'm talking about? Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you, I beg, I, I, I make an emotional appeal with you, brethren, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, 
pleasing and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Verse two, that you may not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the what? Renewing of your mind that you may be able to understand the perfect will of God. And here again, we find Paul begging and making an emotional appeal pleading, look, look at the word, with meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am lowly among you, but being absent, I'm just as bold to you. I want you to know this morning that what, whatever fruit, whatever harvest is produced in your life lets me know where your mind is. The things that are in your life indicate where your mind is. Because your thoughts and your mind produce actions. And it's easy to see where you are in your mind based on what's going on in your life. And it doesn't take a degree in theology or seminary or any other religious practices to, to, to know this, it's, it's simply the word of God. That, that our minds are so important because where you are, where you should be in God is predicated upon your thought life and what's important between your ears. And Paul says again that not only uh, is this important and so important that I'm I'm handling it with, with gentleness and I'm, I'm handling it with a, with a great level of humility, but I'm still being bold and I'm not afraid, he says in verse two, to beg you that even when I'm present that I may be bold, that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some, not everybody, but some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. That's that, 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 that body again. That one thing that's trying to influence your mind. And we, don't, we, don't, we don't beat the flesh up enough. We don't, I don't think we, we really go to war with our flesh like we should. Because the flesh, I'm going to expose it, Sister Pelfrey, in Jesus' name. The flesh doesn't want you to honor God in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Children, if you can listen and comprehend this morning, your flesh doesn't want you to honor your mother and father that your days will be longer on the earth. Your flesh, husbands, don't, doesn't want you to honor your wives and wives, your husband. Your flesh fights against you so much for being able to get up early in the morning and to meet God with prayer and the reading of his word. Your flesh doesn't want you to exalt the name of Jesus, but for you to be the glory hound to take credit for all the blessings that happen in your life. Your flesh doesn't mind, listen, that, that, that your flesh don't want you being uh, uh, in fellowship with the saints. Your flesh doesn't want you to give unto God. Your flesh doesn't want you to render your mind and your finances unto the Lord. Your flesh does not have a problem with you being eternally separated from Christ. And Paul says, listen, the Spirit's got issue with that. Because the Spirit comes in to regenerate you and to revive and to kill the things that are necessary that were not killed in your childhood and in your adolescence and even in your adulthood that, that the Spirit wants to revive you and bring life to things that have been dead, that the Spirit of God wants you to live in your purpose and to be who God has called you to be, that the Spirit of God wants a relationship between you and Jesus Christ, that, that the Spirit is so contrary to the flesh that even Paul describes in Galatians 6 that these two entities are at odd with one another, that they war constantly because the enemy wants my mind. And the Bible says here <clears throat> that we don't walk in the flesh and we don't war according to the flesh. 
Which means if we're going to declare war on our minds this morning, church, this is not a fleshly battle. Which means we can't go to war with fleshly things. That the war that's being waged against your mind is supernatural. Which means we're going to need someone up who is supernatural, Holy Spirit, to equip us and show us what we need to do spiritually to be able to win this war. And then Paul says, for the weapons, get this, because he, he's going now to give us a description of, of, of what type of war this is. He says, this warfare is not carnal, but get this, it's mighty in who? Mighty in who? Come on, say it like you know it. Mighty in who? It's mighty in God. You can't win this war in yourself. You can't win this war within you. The only way to win this war in your mind is the might that exists only in God. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God. And the first, in the first instruction that we've been given in this letter is that the weapon that are these weapons that are not carnal, but are mighty through God are going to pull down what? Strong holds my mind. I need might in God to pull down strongholds. Come here, Ernest. Quickly. Stand right there. Cliff. Come on. Sausage man. Furielli, Cabian, come on, come on, come on. Come here. Yep. Surround me, but give me some space. <laughs> yep. Give me one, give me one right. Yep, yep, yep. Give me a little right, yep, right. Come on, a little more right there. Yep. All right, give me a little bit more room. I don't want to touch you. All right, right there. My mind, my mind. Why it is important, God, I feel God's presence in the name of Jesus. My mind, my mind, my mind. See, Paul here descriptively is describing, come on worship, my mind is descriptive. What Paul is doing is he's describing a, 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 a mountain or a hill in Corinth. And I went back and studied this. That's about 1,300 feet high. It, it, it's, it, it's high and, and it's, it's, it overlooks the city of Corinth. And, and, and on this mountain, on top of this mountain, there, there's a fortress. And if you know anything about a fortress, the fortress has to be built. The fortress didn't build itself. The fortress needed a foundation. It needed walls, it needed a roof, it needed windows, it, 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 it needed maybe heat and air. It, it needed some things to be able to facilitate the people that were living in it. And the problem with these strongholds is, is what we don't realize is that they just don't show up. I'm exposing the enemy this morning. That a, that a, that a stronghold in my mind doesn't just show up. But, but materials have to be brought in because this fortress that Paul is describing, it has to be built. <laughs> and the problem is, is because our minds have not been surrendered in totality unto the Lord. That's why we've got Christians that are, ha that are having to see more psychiatrists than ever before in history. Go and look it up. That's why I was telling you earlier, there's a difference between the brain and the mind. Because if something goes wrong with your brain, you go see a neurologist. But if, yes, God, but if something goes wrong with your mind, you need to go see a psychiatrist. And our minds, they're running crazy. They're out of breath. And because these strongholds, we, we don't pay attention to them. We, we, we haven't waged war on our mind. By the time we look around, we realize that we've got big strongholds surrounding us all in our minds. That's a big man. What, how did you get there? How did you get there? Where did you come from? Where did you come from? Man, you're a big stronghold. My God, what in the world? 
They're here. How did they get here? We never identify them. Some of us right now are still in our 40s and our 50s and our 60s. We are still battling issues of trauma, brokenness, relationships, rejection, being let down, all of that stuff. And now we've taken it into adulthood and we look around because we've never declared war and we've got strongholds surrounding our minds. And this really has done what it's done ladies and gentlemen, is preventing us from not only seeing God for who he truly is, but it's preventing us from becoming who God has created us to be. And now God's power through his word says, listen, if you would just simply wage war and declare war on your mind and, let, and know that I am God Almighty, it's my might, it's my power, it's my strength, then I will give you the ability, if you would just listen to the Holy Spirit, sit down, to pull, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, to pull these strongholds down. Because before I, it was hard to see God how I really needed to see God because these strongholds are big and they skew and block my view of who I am in God. And he says, I wanna pull them down if you will simply acknowledge them and wage war. I need my mind. My wife needs my mind. My children need my mind. This church needs my mind to be geared so I can serve Almighty God. Strongholds. And the enemy loves them. He loves them because it prevents you again from being who you've been called to be. He doesn't want you to pull them down. He doesn't want God to pull them down. <laughs> Watch this. Hope y'all don't mind sitting. For we walk in the flesh, before we walk in the flesh, but we don't war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, through the pulling down of strongholds and casting down. Again, bringing down, casting down arguments and every high thing that has the ability to exalt itself against the knowledge of God. What in your mind has been speaking louder than the voice of Jesus Christ? What argument, listen to me, because today is your day of breakthrough. I know there's a ribbon cutting ceremony and we've got time in the gym. I ain't worried about that, neither is God. But what's been speaking in your mind louder, so loud that you've given more attention to that voice than the voice of Almighty God? Because these arguments, which have the ability to be satanic at their very root, will begin to lift themselves up and platform themselves on a pedestal and convince you that they're better and greater than God. That they will raise themselves up so high that not only will you break fellowship with the church, because that's step one, I tell folks all the time, people don't leave God and then break fellowship, people leave the church, break fellowship, and then ultimately leave God my strongholds. Then he says, this is victory. Casting down, pulling down high things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God, which means you got to know something about God. I wish I had time because the enemy, listen, 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 you, you can't use something to tear these strongholds down if you don't have a knowledge of God. And the enemy wants to take away what you know about God. I'm too fat, I'm too skinny, I'm too dark, I'm too white, I'm too this, stop. Stop. I don't know enough Bible and da, 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 da. the enemy. You know who God is and he knows you. Jesus should win this argument because of the knowledge you have about God. Then he says, bringing every thought into captivity, 
every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish, that's war. That's war. To punish all disobedience when your what? Obedience is fulfilled. You guys can go back to your seats. Thank you. When obedience is fulfilled. Wow. So if I can give my thoughts over to Christ, he is, I mean, he is the lion of Judah. He can be the lion tamer of my thoughts. Because after all, my thoughts will produce something in my actions and my actions are really how I live because it's my life. My mind. In the 90s, it was, I know some of you may remember this, with the, with the egg frying in the pan, but the mind is a terrible thing to waste. <laughs> that was talking about drugs, but I'm talking about spiritual things. You will need your mind not only to serve the Lord, but to be who he's called you to be. And a lot of times it's not until the Holy Spirit reveals these strongholds <laughs> and that we can be honest about ourselves in the presence of God that we can cast down these thoughts, arguments, and imaginations. You know who God is. And most importantly, he knows about you. Let his might, his power, and his love Tear down these things that have prevented you for so long from getting to where God has wanted you to get to. The enemy doesn't want you to have that victory, but God does. Because just like the Spirit of God is competing for your mind, so is the flesh. You decide today who will be victorious in your mind. But as the Bible says in Joshua 24:15. For me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. Standing all over the gym. Let's just declare war. Let's just, I mean, let's just declare war on my mind. I, 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 want, I want God to have my thoughts. I want him to have my mind. I want him to keep me in perfect peace. Life is life. But remember what we talked about in the beginning, God gives us what we need, not always what we want. And because he knows best according to his riches and to his glory, I might as well give him my mind. Will you give the Lord your mind today? Are you really, really prepared to go to war and defend and protect your mind? Because it's worth fighting for. It is worth fighting for.